Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church on Sunday, April 26, 2020, as we worship again on Facebook Live and YouTube and uh, do what we do. Uh, we welcome everybody here, members and guests alike. Uh, everybody is welcome. I uh, want to welcome Dave Brown again. Dave is going to deliver this sermon. Before I ask Dave some pointed questions, uh, I do want everybody to know Pastor Jim is alive and well. He is in the back. He is our audio-visual um, technician this week. He's doing a lot of different duties, but everything's good. Last week, we had some questions about that. Jim is doing well, uh, and if I talk too much, I'm sure he'll mute me, so... Uh, he and his family, this is a big week for all of them. So, Dave, welcome. Uh, thoughts as you prepare for another week of leading. Thank you. I, I just want to remind all of us to maintain our disciplines of social distancing and wearing masks and washing our hands uh, so that we help prevent the spread of the virus. I think that's important for especially those of us in the Christian community. It also occurs to me, Scott, that um, during a difficult time like this, is exactly the time that we need the community of faith. And it's a time that we can't be together. Uh, we can stay connected, and I think that's important. There's a lot of praying going on uh, back and forth. You can use the phone and, and email and texting uh, to keep in touch with one another. But I think that's uh, essential that we remember that we're part of a community of faith. And if anybody's listening in today that doesn't have a home congregation, uh, call the church office. Talk to Jim um, if you are looking for some leadership in your relationship with Jesus, call the church office. We're here for you. And when we get open again, let's get back together. It'll be good to be together again. That's a wonderful message. And as, as special as this can be, we do all long for that time that we're all back together in fellowship. And we, I've had a lot of questions from the moderator end of things. And, you know, when do you think this will happen? And, and, and the perfect short answer, just like in schools, is we don't know. Uh, we're hopeful. And um, I would say this, we continue to monitor things from uh, the Licking County Health Department, uh, the Ohio Department of Health, uh, the Governor's Office, uh, American Baptist Churches, and we will be as, as, as conservative and safe and proactive in our return as we were in closing. So I'm sure it'll be some form of a staged uh, return. And whatever that looks like but you know obviously we want to keep everybody safe we want to get back together as quick as we can but we want to do it in a manner that is safe and, and we take care of that so we worship in fellowship together this day um, in this way and we long for the day that we're all back together so with that let us pray dear Heavenly Father um, we thank you for this time we thank you for this fellowship uh, we thank you for this new normal and we long for those things that we long for but we know you are the great physician we know that you are the great provider and we trust in you that things happen for a reason may we never lose our sense of optimism may we never lose our sense of hope and may we never lose our sense of trust so we join you we ask for you to join us we know that where we are you are be with Dave be with Pastor Jim and his family and everybody. Be with the band. Be with Kevin as he performs and is back with us today. And Dylan and Cody and Amanda and everybody. We thank you for this. We thank you for this time together. And we ask all these things in the words you taught us saying, Our Father, who Thank art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. been healed by the Savior 
and I felt fire from above. I been down to the river. I ain't the same prodigal. Yesterday's gone, and all my sins are forgiven. And I've been washed by the blood. Oh, I'm no stranger to the prison. I've worn shackles and chains, but I've been freed and forgiven. I'm not going back, I'll never be the same. And oh, There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man Can break him down to his knees God, I've been broken more than a time or two Yes, Lord, and he picked me up And showed me what it means to be a man Come on and sing all my hope is in Jesus. Well, thank God my yesterday's gone. No. as we prepare for the uh, community prayers is praise that Kevin is back with us. It's wonderful to have him here. Um, we ask for continued prayers for uh, Kevin and Susan and their extended family in the death of um, Kevin's brother Dwight and all that is entailed in that and not being able to gather as we typically gather. Um, special prayer for Sarah Carter's sister Patty. The praise is things are going better, uh, but there's still that continued need for prayer. Uh, Margaret Ansel still continues at Kendall, and we pray for her and um, the healing that hopefully will take place there. Huge praise to, um, to God for Shardell's sister and her family. The extended family are all clear of the virus at this time. Um, and there, there's countless other ones that are on your heart and uh, are a little tougher to share here, but uh, for all those unasked, or unanswered so far, but also unasked that you know and God knows. So with that said, let us go to prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, we gather here as a community, and we hold up these prayers. We hold up Kevin, and we praise you for the healing and his return to us and that continued healing. We pray for his brother Dwight's family as they mourn his loss and they seek you and in, in, in your guidance. Continue to be with Patty as she continues to heal. Um, let her continue, but praises so far for the progress made. And Margaret and Chardell, sister, and all the extended family and all those people throughout our world that are dealing with countless problems that we don't know about and challenges, but you do. We ask that they feel your presence. We ask that they lean upon you as their rock. Watch over us as a community. Watch over us as a state, as a country, and as a world. Let us pull together. Let us concentrate our efforts and our trust and our faith on that which we share, not that which divides us. Be with us now. Be with Dave as he leads us and brings your word to him, to all of us. We ask these things in our risen Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. sit at the table come taste the grace there's rest for the weary rest that endures earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure so lay down your burdens lay down your shame Faith.
too far So lay down your hurt Lay down your heart Come as you are Come as you are Come as you are Come as you are When you hear the voice of Jesus you can just come as you are. I'd like to share a, a story with you this morning that we have all heard from the time we were little kids. Um, even if you're unchurched and listening in, you probably have heard this story. It's from the 19th chapter of Luke, the first 10 verses. We find these words from the gospel. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass by that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said. Quick, come down, I must be a guest in your house today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. May God add his blessing to this portion of his written word for us today, and may we pray. Lord, bless these words now as we look into this story and as we look into our own lives and hearts, that we will be open to hear the voice of Jesus for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, Ellen and I were members of a congregation uh, some years ago, and there was another older couple who lived, who sat next to us in worship in the congregation. His name was Gil, and she was Dorothy, and every once in a while we'd chat with them. One Sunday after worship, Gil came to me and said, uh, i got to tell you this story. I haven't told anybody else, but I've got to tell somebody. He said, last week, Dorothy and I had gone to New York City, and we stayed overnight at a hotel. On the next morning, uh, Dorothy had dressed, and I was sitting in my pajamas and bare feet, reading the newspaper, sipping my coffee, my room service breakfast. They could afford it. And he said, suddenly, while I was reading the paper, the glass in the window in our hotel room burst out. There was this tremendous explosion, and there was debris flying all over and clouds of smoke rolling down the street. And we got up and we left. We ran out of our hotel room, as everybody else was doing, out into the street. Everybody was in a, a panic, rushing down the street south toward the Battery, which is the south end of New York City. He said he was running along for a couple of blocks amidst all of the crowd, and suddenly a man, a well-dressed businessman, came running past. He was in a full business suit carrying his satchel, and he stopped just in front of me, and he opened his satchel, and he reached in, and he pulled out an almost brand-new pair of Italian leather shoes and handed them to me, closed up his satchel, and ran down to the battery. Gil said, I'd never seen that man before. But I realized then why I was having such trouble running. The street was strewn with glass and all kinds of debris, and I had nothing on my feet. My feet were swollen and bleeding. And this man just stopped and gave me his extra shoes. 
You know, it's during a time of crisis and pandemonium and pandemic that it often brings out the best in us. Uh, we saw, oh, a month, month and a half ago, a, a man who owned a local brewery who was going to shut down and then heard about the, um, the need for hand sanitizers. And so he called his crew together and said, we're going to make hand sanitizer and we're going to give it out. And they have given out thousands of bottles of hand sanitizer made in their brewery to hospitals and uh, uh, frontline workers and EMTs. Other breweries and distilleries have started that practice. There are hundreds of them now who are making hand sanitizer and delivering it free to healthcare workers everywhere. There was a restaurant owner a month ago or so who was having to close down because everybody has these stay-at-home orders. And he said, I've got a stock room of food right now. He called his crew together and said, we're going to make meals and hand them out to people who've lost their jobs now. And they have made thousands of meals to hand out, as other restaurants have been doing, and great corporations who've been feeding the hungry, the long lines of traffic. You've seen them in the news reports who are waiting for a box of food. Those are good impulses. Neighbors helping neighbors. Medical workers going into the face of danger without the right kind of protective equipment over and over again, giving themselves away for the good of others. But unfortunately, as you well know, we don't live in a world where everybody rises to their better nature. That there are some who give in to their lower impulses, those scam artists. Maybe you've gotten a phone call that uh, your Aunt Mary is in uh, the hospital and she requires a great test to see what the problem is with her, but her insurance doesn't cover it. And she only needs $2,000 up front so that she can pay for this before she goes in. And we'll take care of that for you if you just give me your credit card number. Or someone who's saying, we have an, a special insurance policy. We don't know if you know or not, but your insurance policy doesn't cover a pandemic. So we'll sell you an insurance policy that will be sure to cover all expenses related if you happen to catch COVID-19. It's only $1,000, and you can send that to us over the phone. And other scam artists who will call just to collect information, maybe they pretend to be from the Social Security office that the system is so overwhelmed that we don't know if you will get your right um, uh, uh, information or not. So tell us what your information is, your address and your contact information and your social security number. We'll make sure that we have it cleared up for you. Scam artists come out of the woodwork. There have been something like 18,000 scams already uh, announced in the last month or so here in America. So we have to be careful. And, you know, we privilege those. We like those people who rise to their better nature during a time like this but we really look down on and disrespect those who really are the bottom feeders of our society, and they're always available. Zacchaeus was a member of that second category. He was a hated member of society because legally he was a cheat. He was hired by the Roman government to collect taxes, and the Roman government knew exactly how much they needed from all the different people there in Jericho where Zacchaeus was the head tax collector. And all the Roman government cared about was that you send in the amount of money that we demand from those people, but you can collect as much as you want. And so tax collectors had a, a, a talent for charging people twice or three times the amount, the tax that was really due, and they could say to those people legally, if you don't pay up, I'll see that you're thrown in, jizz, in prison. So tax collectors were the shunned people of society. They preyed on the poor and the widows, and the elderly, and the disenfranchised. Every time they'd go to town, the townspeople would turn their backs on them and look away or call them names or spit on them. So their only social community was other tax collectors and prostitutes and those who were categorized as sinners. But these people were lonely. 
Zacchaeus had a problem one day because he heard that Jesus was coming through town. He'd already heard about Jesus. He knew who Jesus was, and he just wanted to get a glimpse of him. But as he came to push through the crowd, he couldn't get out. He was a little shorter than the rest of the people. They would not let him. They elbowed him out of the way. And so he ran ahead and found a tree with a low limb in it, and he climbed up in that limb because Jesus was coming that way. Here came Jesus. He stopped in front of the tree in which Zacchaeus was sitting. And he shouted up to him, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to be a guest in your house today. Zacchaeus came down and responded to Jesus' invitation to be a guest. Jesus knows your name. It doesn't matter what you're going through, where you are in the social order, or what's important to you. Jesus knows your name. One of my preaching students in Russia, his name was Igor Kukushkin. He was a, a sailor. Uh, he signed up with a merchant marine vessel for one year in his younger ages. And, um, and they were uh, carrying equipment, food, to scientific uh, outstations and to intelligence gathering communities all the way from, uh, from the Arctic up to the Bering Sea in the, in the uh, Arctic Circle, in the Antarctic to the Arctic. He remembers the storms at sea. He remembers hanging on for dear life as the, this little craft was working its way up a 45 degree inclined wave taller than our building and the icy wind biting into his face and into his hands and scarcely being able to catch a breath. They would go into port and Igor would go on a drunken binge and meet all the women that he could uh, take care of in the time that they were in port. And then back on ship, he had a messed up life. He lasted about eight months on this ship and then he got sick. And so the merchant marine vessel let him off in a Russian city and took him to the hospital, and he was there in the hospital for several days. And then he was released from the hospital. He had no job, he didn't know this city, he didn't know where he was going, and he stumbled around in this city, and he was released from the hospital. And he was walking down a street, and he heard some singing coming from a building behind closed doors. And he went over to the building, and he listened. The song had a great interest to him. The song said this, O oh God, your sea is so vast, the storm is so tremendous, and my boat is so small. Save me, O oh God, save me. When the singing had finished, Igor opened those doors and stepped inside. This was a, a Russian Baptist congregation that had sung he asked the congregation if they would sing that song again. And they did. And they welcomed him and made him feel at home. And the next day, Igor said, I gave my life to Jesus. I repented. I knew what had been going on in my life. You see, Jesus knew Igor's name, and he called him and invited Igor to say, let me come into your house as a guest, and I will change everything. Igor discovered that when he responded to Jesus as guest, it would be life-changing. Uh, that's what's going on with Zacchaeus. He, he, he spends a little time with Jesus, takes Jesus home. He must have some kind of a following, probably other tax collectors and prostitutes and others in town who will eat with Zacchaeus, who know him, are his circle of neighbors and friends. Zacchaeus, in the midst of that outfit, after meeting Jesus and what Jesus has said and what Jesus stands for, stood before his people and said, if I have cheated anyone, I will pay them back four times as much and I will give half of my wealth away to the poor. Zacchaeus had come to the place of realizing when Jesus invites himself as guest into our homes, he doesn't just come to sit by, but he comes to change our lives and to transform us. He comes really to be Lord. 
And the question for us today is, where are you in your pilgrimage with Jesus? This business of Jesus being guest in my home is a never-ending process. There are always issues that we need to work on. And maybe you've never come to Jesus at all, but today's the day you can say, Jesus, come, I respond to your invitation to be a guest in my home. And he will come and love you. He knows your name. He will begin the process of transformation, which may be radical for you, but it goes on for the rest of your life, and he brings your best nature out of you as he partners with you in this world. Or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but you've let your faith slide, and and there are areas of your life that you know very well you need to turn over to Jesus. And he comes as guest to say, let me transform you in this area of your life. The first time I was in New York City was in 1970. I was there with a group of students. We went into the city on Sunday morning to go to the Calvary Baptist Church, which is in, come to find out, in the Salisbury Hotel, just south of Central Park. We went in the back door and climbed up some stairs as we were guided and opened up the doors into this cavernous sanctuary in the middle of the Salisbury Hotel where the Calvary Baptist Church uh, met for worship. We were up on the second balcony somewhere. It was a beautiful uh, setting and beautiful music. Uh, the, the music was inspiring. The prayers were uplifting. And the message, we had come to hear from Dr. Stephen Olford, who is one of the great pulpiteers and orators of our day. And in the program, Dr. Olford was not there that day. It was Dr. Bob Cook. I'd never heard of this guy. I didn't want to hear what he had to say. I was just sitting back and a little bit bored. But From the first moment that this jolly, bald-headed guy got up and began to speak, he preached about discipleship. And he ended with a story that I have never forgotten. It has made a long, an ongoing impression in my life. He said... He, uh, he goes, he's president of King's College, and he said, I'm invited to speak in many places. Just about every weekend I'm gone, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Saturday and Sunday. He said, about three months ago, I was invited to a Midwest city uh, to speak on a Saturday night and then preach on Sunday morning, and gladly I went. I was only given information about the house where I was staying, uh, the Smith House, and such and such an address. I had no phone number. I didn't know where this meeting was going to be held. All I knew was where this was, and I was due at their home at 5 o'clock for dinner. Well, my plane got in at 2.30 in the afternoon, and I thought, what, what am I going to do? Should I just sit here in the airport and do a little bit of work, or should I go over to the Smith House and, and just excuse myself? Maybe I could just relax over there, and finally he decided, I'll do that. He got a cab arrived at the Smith residence at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He carried his uh, valise up to the door, rang the doorbell, and didn't hear anything. He rang it again, and then he heard a voice from up in the cavern of the house saying, Just a minute! And he heard footsteps coming down the stairs, and the door opened wide, and there was Mrs. Smith, her hair was in curlers. She had a pink bathrobe on and her slippers. And she had a great uh, deer in headlights look in her eyes. And she said, oh, oh, Dr. Cook, how good to see you. Please come in. He apologized for being early. He said, my plane got in early. I got an earlier flight and I didn't know where else to go. I don't know where the church is that we're going to tonight, but all I had was your address. She said, no, please come in, come in. She took him into the living room swept the morning newspaper off the couch and said, please have a seat. Make yourself at home and I'll be with you in just a moment. He sat there. She ran upstairs. She was obviously fiddling with Johnny in the bathtub, getting him out of the tub. He finally got out. She went and took the curlers out of her hair and, and got dressed and put some makeup on, came down, rushed in the kitchen, put the potatoes on and came back to where Dr. Cook was sitting patiently and said, now why don't you come out to the kitchen and we'll talk. What Bob Cook said was, Mrs. Smith brought me in the house and said, sit here, make yourself at home. And what she really meant was, sit here and don't make a move until I'm ready for you. 
Then he said, don't we do that with Jesus also? We say, come on in, Jesus. Be a guest in my house. But just sit here and don't meddle too much. I don't want you messing with my relationships. I don't want you uh, dealing with my schedule. I certainly don't want you looking in my checkbook. Just sit here until I'm ready for you. When Jesus invites himself to be a guest in our home, he comes to live within us and to become not just a guest, but to become Lord of our lives. And the more we turn our lives over to him, the more he transforms us into the kind of people that we were destined to be when God created us. As we follow Jesus, as we trust him, as Zacchaeus did, we find that he that Jesus is transformational, he knows your name, and he loves us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us as we are. And so my prayer for us is to keep growing, keep allowing Jesus lordship in our lives. And I trust that you will do that too as you listen in to this service today. May we pray together. Lord, we know that you know who we are and know everything about us. Even in the midst of our sin and separation from you, in all that we are and all that we have become. And we come to you today, as Zacchaeus did, and we hear your voice inviting you to be guest in our home. And we respond to that because we know the depth of your love for us, that you've died for us, that you love us so deeply, and that you come to restore us to a right relationship with God and with our world around us. We offer you our lives. We allow Jesus to become not just a guest, but Lord of all that we are and all that we become. In his name we pray. Amen. Shame is a prison as cruel.
between death and life there on the tree the lamb of god was crucified he went down to hell and he took back every key Thank you.